I'd first like to thank the Asia Society and Tambun Hui for inviting me. And uh, I, I knew him in a different existence. He was then the uh, head of the office for the first Singapore Biennale. And he was the frankest and most honest civil servant I've ever encountered. So <laughs> it's very refreshing to see he's been recognized elsewhere. And of course, my good friend, Apinan, who was, he came to Canberra in 1991 for the first conference on modernities and postmodernities in Asian art. I also need to thank the National Gallery of Singapore, uh, in whose uh, publications part of my talk will appear, as well as the Australian Research Council, who funded the research by now, some time ago, which you will see, and Art Monthly Australia, where I published some of the work on Da Chi Dang, the Australian Vietnamese artist, we'll be looking at in a minute. So, um, I don't want to be too academic, but we really have a problem with Asia, which I'm not going to go into here, but it's in the paper. Uh, I might just pay attention a little to Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia contains entities, cultural and state units, which neither are as large or as interlinked, nor as putatively, supposedly homogeneous as those in Northeast Asia. It's a different kind of place. Indeed, the notion of Southeast Asia, despite the common spread of Indic and Islamic beliefs from, West, from the West and Confucian familistic concepts from the North, is preeminently a modern one. And despite later interregional trading, one would really have to go back to the 8th century Sri Vijaya Kingdom to see what might Southeast Asia might be considered as devolving from. Uh, Southeast Asia rises, as some of us are intimately aware, because of Euro-American colonialism, because of its defeat, because of the rise of nationalism, and because of new nation-states. The fictions of nationalism or the national are opposed and superimposed by the fictions of independence, the post-colonial, and the underlying differentiation of the colonial. These notions are now allied with strong and in, in some respects apparently stable states, at least for the last 30 years or so. And these states are the units of international relations. These are used to privilege and hold language and belief and economic systems. Despite the rootedness of current concepts of negotiation in the realities of business deals, where the final intent is to understand the terms for exchange between artist and the primary dealer or the peripatetic independent curator, among other kinds of mediators, there is too negotiation between external and internal positions and processes, between the Im imposed amnesia of historical events and the cost of forgetting and remembering the truths of history between the regional and the global and so forth. Indeed, the alternative trajectory of negotiation may be seen as more fruitful as a meaning towards a movement of agreement by discussion and the establishment or acceptance of a shared interpretation of an artwork by the getting round the obstacles to this achievement. Now, I remind myself. Yeah, that one. In Indonesia, we're going to look chiefly at the work of FX Hasono, which is in the exhibition, or works parallel to the ones in the exhibition, and his negotiations with local histories, which are by no means without their pre precursors. And, that, and I, I, we could do a whole prehistory, but I think the problem of exhibitions is that they, these days, anyway, this, they tend to cut out the prehistory. In the case of Sujiona, we've only got room to really look at one artist, which is, in the case of Hasona, we've only got one room to look at one artist, which is Sujiona, from 1913 to 1986, who bridges both the colonial, the post-independence, and the post-national state cons consolidation eras, the final era of the so-called new order. Indeed, Sujiona might serve as something of a model. Here's two of works being compared by him. Uh, for art negotiation, because he mastered modernism, our European modernism, to, the, to which he didn't really declare his full indebtedness. In fact, it's only become clear very recently that 
the nationalist artists of the art group called Prasagi, who claim to have developed a kind of autonomous in Indonesian expression in, in painting, actually had seen quite a lot of modernist painting from Europe in Jakarta in the 1930s, late 1930s, which is, without going into too many details, perfectly clear between the, sh the work with Chagall, which was exhibited in 1938 in Jakarta, and the work of the year after, before the open mos mosquito nest, net, net a big one. And I'll just leave that image with you. Sugiono changes the emotional con con connotation of a relatively fixed sub subject matter. He did this late, also with later images of the war for independence and the display of a proper concern for, pe for the people, for the little people. Uh, in uh, work when he was a member of the Communist Party up until 1959. But after that, after the coup, which has, of course, received great attention this week with the release of recent documents from the American archives, after that he went on to do an exploration of inner landscapes full of private dreamings and surrealist crazy fantasizing in the work on the right, uh, of um, 1980, um, where he fantasized it of himself as an eccentric wan wanderer and covered it with poems. Let's move to uh, Harsono. Harsono was born in 1949 and belongs to almost the first cohort of Indonesian artists for whom direct experience of colonialism was absent or its residues highly attenuated. The past for uh, Harsono was always present but as a real and ghostly companion, traduced in the historical present by its denials, particularly the, nut, the massacres of 1965-66, which Harsona himself had seen as an adolescent in 1965, and also those he learned of, such as the Chinese massacres his father witnessed in 1947. And in his father's files, his father was the town photographer, he discovered the, far, the photographs his father had taken when the bones of the Chinese victims were disinterred and reburied for a memorial in a fairly long period, I'm not clearly discriminated, but anyway, 49-51. Harsana would go to art school in Jogja at the Academy of Fine Arts Academy of Indonesia in 1969, but he was suspended in 1975 for signing a radical manifesto and only continued his studies to graduation at a different art school, Institute, the Ikaje in Jakarta, from 87 to 91, as a much older artist. This antecedent situation is of some importance in uh, Hassan's formation, and unfortunately not at all apparent in the exhibition, because behind his work was a split between an academic, nationalistically sanctioned romantic realism in Jakarta and a, which continued the sort of Indonesian lyricism of Pasagi in 1938, as seen already in Sujayono, uh, particularly the picture of the gorilla we saw. Um, the other branch of the art movement largely concentrated in art movements in the Institute of Technology in Bandung, which is a former Dutch teacher training institute which became a science university with an art department from where some modernist abstract teachers like Fajr Siddiq on the right would shift. They move from Bandung to Jogjakarta in 19, after 1965-66. And uh, Fajr Siddiq was his teacher and works of his student period can be is seen on the left. That's one split. Another split in his work, or bifurcation as I prefer to call it, is seen in the After Darkness catalogue. It's fairly easy to understand between a generalised Indonesian identity and the possibilities within that of a Chinese expression, if only as a particular sensibility with an attributed ethnic background. This bifurcation was also achieved and articulated by the targeting of those with the Chinese background during the War of Independence, 45 to 49, as traitors in the pay of the Dutch, and the anti-communist massacres were of the 65-66, uh, uh, repeated the um, attacks on the Chinese, in which, as we have be recently been re reminded this week, both the United States, the Australian and the British governments were highly complicit. 
A third on ideological bifurcation is between the ideological compliance ordained by the state and the search for individual artistic expression, allowing the constitution of an artistic eye. Here, I suppose, the independence of the Sangha, art workshops, found a collocation with academy-based art student opposition to authority, certainly in the 70s and through to the 90s. There seem to be many possible parallels between small group formation among university students and the organisation of Sangha. And these groups all had leaders, of which, as you can see in the work on the, the left, Hasana was one, the rebel leader, as it were. Um, we have to realise that this work didn't appear in a vacuum, because if the... Sorry, uh, did it go back? Oh, I wonder if it's... I seem to have jumped out of the slide. I'm sorry, I, I left it out, probably. Yes, I left it out. Um, but um, so, so, so certainly before the leader of the young radicals type of position of uh, Harsono in uh, the early 90s, at any rate, and mid-80s, theoretically, before that, he would have been party to an understanding of LECRA, the communist art organization, of which Sujiyana had been a member before he was forced to leave in 1959, um, which may have indeed criticized precisely the kind of bourgeois individualism and uh, uh, reactionary traditionalism in the art world in favor of a kind of Soviet or Maoist realism. When later in the 1990s, Hasana came to make one of the aim of his practice, the reactivation of buried pasts, which we can see, I'm sorry, in the work, in the wrong sequence here, this one, yeah. Um, I slightly changed the order in editing it. Um, he uh, started to refer back, not simply to 65, but to 49, 50, uh, and to the um, photographs of his father took when the Chinese massacred Chinese were disinterred and reburied. We've seen um, many pictures of the tombstones, but the, actually the fa these are the photographs from his father's collection in that work I showed you first, um, where he's, in, in a certain sense, using the refer reference to the 1949 massacre and pre-49 massacres um, as a way of talking about an event which is not 1949, which is actually the, the massacres he himself witnessed as a young adolescent in 65, 66. So there's a ver there are many bifurcations in uh, double principles in Hasano's work. Um, and the fourth one is a sort of a temporal split where anachronistically spaces and replicas are buried of buried or tabooed events are changed or referred to by the ex exhibition and installation of photographic and other mementos, particularly, of course, mementos of his own work, earlier work in the uh, so-called uh, New Art Movement, the Garakan Sani Rupa Baru in Indonesia, which he starts to rework in new pieces in the 2000s, as you can see, the photograph from the catalogue and the uh, remade piece on the, uh, on the left. Now, um, the uh, new art movement, as it was called, um, was really a protest against blatant pre uh, academic narrow narrowness and self-seeking at jury by senior academic people in a biennale. Um, they did polite, impolite works such as uh, Jim, uh, Jim Pankat's work here, I'll just point it to you, just do that. which is a sculpture of um, uh, a, a, a re reproduction of a sculpture which exists in um, Ken Dedes, which exists in a Dutch museum, but is here made fun of by this young uh, lady's jeans and prominent pubic hair um, in a um, kind of rebel work about the associ association with the current elite. 
of some bravery, of course, in 76. Um, in fact, the arg our argument, uh, it seems, at the time in the new art movement was not so much about um, how forms would be, could be remobilized from the past, but how they could be recontextualized inside a new work. And you can see that also in the magically visualized fantasies, such as the paintings of Dede Eri Supria on the right, uh, and a number of other artists, which all effectively resisted the government and its putative agents in academia. I'm sure you're getting a different view of Tomasono than perhaps the one or two later protest pieces you might see downstairs. Um, Harsano left the field of academic art practice for about 10 years, preferring to work as a commercial graphic designer on the one hand, and then become involved with non-governmental organizations forcing particular agendas such as environmental concerns. It's only at the end of the 1980s that he re-enters the academic art world as a different institution and also a different institution when he had better intellectual collaborators. If in 1973 Hassan had felt the need for greater social development in the new art movement, by 1975 he found it through contextualization, installation, I beg your pardon, such as his Paling Top, the ready-made of a cage and machine gun, which you can see on the right. Painting everyday objects as a subversive reality is also curiously like a kind of left-wing mimetic realism. It's showing something physical which denies the, if you like, the overlying elite values which control it. Um, and through the 1990s, uh, begin, but, but actually beginning earlier in 1982 with this very first important installation work on the right, um, Harsono had realized that objects could function as conduits for personal stories which might otherwise be concealed. And you might think he was by himself in this kind of work, but if you look at these two pieces together, the cover of one of the last collective acts of the new art movement, uh, which was a, um, a kind of fake supermarket fair in 1987, and the work of, in the same year, I'm not sure which is antecedent, um, by Semsa Siahan, which is now on view in Singapore, by the way, if you're going there. Um, he um, basically resisted the political status quo through uh, the tra tra traducing of, of, of commonly accepted symbols. And uh, Hasano was expelled from uh, Itebe in Bandung uh, in 1975. Uh, and there were other works of resistance, such as Semsar's work, you can see, um, which, is a, which contains with this a kind of parody. And the word quotation is here relevant. The flood of parodies was a representation of daily goods that had been taboo to those of high artistic tastes. Uh, previously considered unfit for exhibition in a gallery. From the work downstairs, you're going to be familiar with various repositions of the Chinese or Chineseness of Indonesian artists in the early 2000s, which was possible because of the overthrow of Suharto, the fort collapse of his regime. And these include the work on the left, which is a um, documentary about the massacres in 1948. So he actually not only used his father's photographs in installations, but he also went back and interviewed people who survived the massacres um, in a documentary uh, installation. Um, but Hasano is complicated, uh, and this complexity sometimes is difficult to communicate because um, in some works, instead, around about 2010 to 2013, instead of asserting Chineseness, which he'd never had, Hasana went into a more difficult place, which is his hybridity, as produced by the Indonesian context in which he'd grown up. I suspect this led him away from the notion of cultural authenticity, just at that point where many in Indonesia, freed of the hegemony of the new order, were cleaving for some kind of traditional fixation. Um, he was displaying, displaying a, a kind of courage in, dis, in experiencing him, himself as other within his own society. 
and um, he did say that after the quote, quote, after the Suharto regime fell, a culture of violence became even more prevalent in our society. Witnessing the ambivalence towards the fate of the people on the one hand and the narrow-minded priority placed on each group's own needs sickened me at this time. So on the one hand, he's sickened at consumerism, the violence against the Chinese. But on the other hand, he's reaching into what might be described as a hybrid world where his Chinese experience and his Islamic experience in the society meet. And that can be seen in this work, The Raising, the Raining Bed, which uh, was first done in 2010 and then uh, re-shown at first at the Yogyakarta Biennale and then at the Biennale of Sydney. And um, some of his texts are accompanied by, some of his works are accompanied by interesting poetic, uh, if you like, references. In this particular case, I'll read the poem translated in the notes of the artist for the 2016 installation. In my sleep the past unfolds. At the tip of the pen, history is invented. At the tip of the rifle, history is fooled. By the end of the falls, history is swept away. I'm presuming I could go on to three o'clock, is that right? Are you going to slightly extend the session? So I've got 10 minutes. Well, now we move to Vietnam, different story. And I shall simply skip my first Vietnamese uh, precursor like Sudiono examining an artist who resigned from the party in 1960 and move on to an artist who survived this. And uh, by the way, the photograph on the left would appear to be uh, the basis, the visual basis for a work by is, that, is it Patty Chung? Is that right? These are now at um, now at, at this moment on show in um, Tyler um, hmm, Tyler Rowland's Tiffany Chung, sorry Tiffany Chung on Tyler Rowland's gallery, and it was taken by an Australian photographer uh, working on a German rescue ship in uh, in the um, South China Sea in 1981. Da Chi Dang was born in Saigon in 1966 as a Chinese Vietnamese. Even though the war ended in 1975 when he was nine, he did not leave by boat until 1982 when he was 16. That gives you a very interesting bracket on his experience. His experiences seem to have three circles which overlap. One is the war in Vietnam itself. The other is the survival of a refugee followed by his move to Australia. And finally, the most sophisticated, mature discourse as, a, as he becomes aware of himself as an artist with photographic training in art school, of course. And he's already this year, or two years ago, I'm sorry, gained a doctor in creative arts in Brisbane. A light motif of recollections is the abjectness of the refugee exile, subject to parental as well as external so social domination, even before they encountered the resistance and often hostility of parts of the reception culture. In many ways, these children were not allowed to become persons, even in the sometimes restricted manner of traditional fam Vietnamese family, subject as, all, as this was to all the upheaval of civil war and murderous criminally meaningless foreign intervention, which, of course, Australia was a willing partner. The goal of an artist is to become a person with autonomous understanding and individually articulated issues and subjects. It seems that many artists had to face this dilemma overseas without their normal home supports in a worldwide diaspora. Those who succeeded like Dachi and some other Australian Vietnamese may be exceptions, and I want you to remember that the many people do not actually manage to do anything with their experience, their trauma, their exile. They face a greater hurdle. And I actually wonder 
um, how many of them were unable to find their own personalities through their creative work in art, writing, theatrical comedy, or even cuisine. We always think of the ones who succeed because they're remarkable, but there are many who don't. We are left with double survivors. These artists are double survivors. Those who pass through the hell of the boats and the pain of readjustment, and those who also successively learn to find a métier, a means to express themselves in life. Dachi Dan began his photographic work in um, 19, early 1990s, returning to um, Saigon for the first time in 1994. But he's noticed that, in himself has noticed, that most of the photographic work I did, quotes unquote, seemed to depict homes of the people whose lands I was exploring, and in particular homes and temporary shelters of the dislocated and disenfranchised. He early on recognized that Vietnamese present, present their diasporic experience through unrecorded oral stories because they do not express themselves in writing well and by implication could be caught in the expression of their emotions through photography. Um, what's remarkable about Dan, Dan Chi Dang's own writings about home is his careful identification of different notions of home, chiefly varying between two poles of home as center, which is outward looking, and home as identity, which is inward looking. Refugees detach home from specific spatial lo locations and create a notion of being for a given culture of reception. I'm skipping in a little here. His growth as an artist and its maturation of his discourse was not only a linear progression. Uh, perhaps we should go back one to this work. Uh, really synthesizing photographs he did after his return to Vietnam in 1994. This is a synthesized photograph. It's not an original photograph in the street. He overlays, very sophisticatedly overlays different photographs and different traces of different photographic processes. They were a kind of a anticipation of future ability to handle multiple levels and contents. Uh, and this sort of extended into his work in Australia or with particular Australian subjects. Um, he started to do work which talked about the colonial experience, or historical colonial experience in Australia in the work of 2012 called Captain Van Dang in the Great South Land. This is a single channel video animation of a Vietnamese explorer greeting people of different origins arriving on a beach in Sydney. Somewhat humorously, he deploys the symbol of the famous 19th century Australian bushranger and folk hero, i.e. killer bandit, meeting an Arabian woman on the right there. Um, he also became very conscious of how ca camera foot technique allowed him to do certain things. He said he'd been searching for a tool that allows me to negotiate these spaces and cultures, signifies displacement and the search for belonging and identity by members of the Vietnamese diaspora in Australia. The pinhole camera, as you can see on the right, produces infinite depth of field on the same projection plane. Pinhole camera images have a soft focus and distort reality in a similar way to how we see things in dreams. He liked that feature of the photography. And this image on the right is of some interest because it's actually taken from a subject matter he developed on an island off the Queensland coast where he did a photo project which had once been a leper colony. In Dang's mind, this island was associated with Pulau Bintong on the coast of Malaysia where he'd been kept from a year, for a year after his transfer from Australia. To slightly abbreviate the conclusion. Dachi Dang is not just interested in singularity of vision and has somewhat paradoxically thought that the pinhole camera can overcome this. The idea, he says, of single point perspectives seems to suggest a refraction of a very specific point of view, a point or instant in space-time. It can also function as a site of enmeshment or a source of multiplicity. He says, my society does not know how to cope with the layered otherness it has applied to me. I think we better stop there. 
I can't, I haven't got time to go on to Dachi Dang, so sorry. Right. Thank you. Thank you. John's just stepped up for a moment. <laughs> you can grill him at the break for the remainder. Um, it's very strange because I'm going to start this with him in the gents. Um, I'm going to give a very short uh, commentary uh, or a response rather to, to two specific terms that came out in uh, Professor Clark's uh, presentation. And I have to say I'm speaking as, as a Southeast Asianist, so it's a very particular uh, kind of view and having uh, curated shows, including uh, the one downstairs, uh, on on this topic. Uh, and it's interesting that, that Professor Clark stopped where he did, because so does my commentary. <laughs> so the stars align. Um, very quickly, I, I wish to start basically with the term Southeast Asia and the concept of regionality. The, this term, Southeast Asia, has been having a rather difficult time recently. Um, and I see especially grad students. I'm not, I haven't seen grad students in New York, but in Asia. And it's very fashionable now to start with Southeast Asia is, is not a reality. It's an illusion. Uh, it is said to be a product of Eurocentrism. I think it was mentioned uh, as in passing earlier. To it being a creation of variously British or post-war CIA machinations to stave off mainly the advance of communism. It seems to also have become a kind of whipping child for post-colonial anxieties about the negative repercussions of Western interferences in the developing world, particularly uh, immediately after the, the period of post-colonial um, uh, process had begun. Without going into a separate debate, which by now has a rich and diverse literature, I want to make a simple point about much earlier periods, periods before uh, the modern period, before the coming of uh, modern and contemporary art, before the start of easel painting, uh, which clearly was mainly brought by the colonial masters when they came uh, to this region and started the first sort of Western-style art schools in Southeast Asia. Um, instead, I want to talk about the Southeast Asia before the coming of the Portuguese. And there are, by now in the literature, uh, not within art, but if we look at anthropology, if we look at history, there are several discernible ideas and practices which are closely associated with the underlying indigenous animism that are shared by many of the cultures of the region. Within this, uh, when I was studying this region, I was constantly told by uh, my friends and who are scholars of Indonesia that you know Southeast Asia is unique and one of the ways in which that uniqueness was manifested is that a lot of times we talk about ideas of 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 the Ulu Hulu and the Hilir, the upriver and downriver, that a lot of the social organization and how they talk about each other was in these terms of whether you are an upriver community or you are a downriver community. The belief in the mutually porous boundaries that separate the physical human world and the non physical realm of gods, spirits, and demons. Uh, and I refer. I can refer everyone to the sort of essays written by Geoffrey Benjamin uh, on on animism in particular. The relatively high status of women before uh, the colonial period, the use of the backstrap loom as a kind of distinctive feature of textile weaving, wet rice cultivation, and the list goes on. In this regard, the work of Anthony Reed and his students, particularly in the two volume study Southeast Asia in the Age of Commerce, is very illuminating, particularly volume one, talks about how when the colonial masters came, actually they came into a region that was very conscious that it was something and that if you are not this something, you are something else. 
Um, the difficulty, of course, is in pinning down a concrete set of indicators that would effectively and definitively demonstrate regionality. And it's complicated by two circumstances. One, the, the historical fact is that the region has been the recipient, in fact, a very active recipient of successive waves of religious, political and cultural ideas from outside the region. So um, the English geographer Doreen Massey's um, when she was talking about uh, economic landscapes, the complexity of economic landscapes as it referred to localities is quite instructive because she uses the metaphor of, of geology, of how in certain places, you know, that have received great waves of uh, cultural influence, you know, the, the, what we call the cult local culture is actually a sedimentation you know, that is coming in that has a kind of historical narrative, but it's a kind of patchwork that goes this way, like a geological formation. And she uses terms such as the rings, the rounds of sedimentation. And Southeast Asia seems to fit this kind of idea. So when we talk about, in a sense, not really homogenous, what we mean, possibly, one way of looking at it is this, this idea of, of the geologic formation. Added to that, of course, uh, in the much earlier period, the migration of the peoples who speak one of the variants of the Austronesian language from the areas of what we now call southern China, down the Philippines, Indonesia and up the Malay Peninsula, have left markers throughout many communities at, at, of the region and, and, and from sociology, we always talk about the Austronesians as one of and what has been left and brought by the Austronesians as one of the defining uh, ways in which you know certain things are shared in the region. For example, um, the fact that the architecture of the indigenous Southeast Asian house in many places is quite similar to the architecture of the boat is very, very distinctive. Of course, you know, the migration came by boat. Moving on to uh, the 20th century, of course, that's since the 20th century, the peoples of the region, more importantly, especially when we are talking about modern and contemporary art, have often been conscious of their positionality with regard to the larger polities of India, the Islamic world, and especially China. Of course, it is now by uh, quite well known that earlier sources such as those in the Chinese world refer to the region as a distinct realm you know that's where the term the Nanhai or the Southern Seas came about and in colonial Singapore you would always refer to Southeast Asia as the Nanhai so Professor Clark's analysis is astute in demonstrating how, and I quote from his paper, the fictions of nationalism or the national are opposed or superimposed upon by the fictions of independence, the post-colonial and the underlying differentiation of the colonial. Close quote. Within this complex of ideas, what Professor Clark draws us into is that the nation figures large in the modern and contemporary art from the countries of this region. Specifically, the idea that art practice and art discourses are an indelible part of the process of negotiating the nation. Back in 2011, I curated with Ayola Lenzi and Kairudin Hori uh, a big exhibition of political art from Southeast Asia entitled, the same name com terms comes up again, the title of the show was called Negotiating Home, History and Nation as one of the collateral events for the 2011 Singapore Biennial Open House. One of the underlying premises was that as post-colonial and relatively new nation states, the act of negotiations as seen in the art from the region was a way of willing almost the nation into being. These three ideas of home, of history, particularly when it is silenced or redacted, and of the nation, what the nation should be, who should be in the nation, and who should be able to speak of the nation, are preoccupations of a lot of artistic production uh, across the region. Professor Clark's presentation reminds us that this process has a long historical span. 
uh, he talks about Radin Saleh, and I would like to add to that that actually in that sort of late 19th century period, many, many of the first generation of oil painters, particularly those trained in continental Europe and returning back to the colonies, uh, have used the kind, the same kind of strategies that Saleh was using, including, of course, uh, Juan Luna. And the historical irony, of course, is that the introduction of oil painting and easel during the colonial period, yeah, oil painting on easel during the colonial period to the region was what enabled also serious experiments in these sort of initial attempts at articulating a self-identity that was separate from the colonial metropole. One thing, of course, particularly of Juan Luna's portrait of the two ladies walking away into the glorious future as Spain and Philippines. And of course, Spain being the elder sister is guiding the young sister of, of the Philippines up the steps to the glorious future. So one version of that is in the national collection of the National Gallery in Singapore. In the current period, uh, we are also reminded of the Thai artist Nati Utarit's work, which has for many years been a long uh, sort of almost durational performance that is a reaction to the Florentine school of painting syllabus that formed his art education at Silapakon University. You know, and, and he talks about, Nati talks about how his work is, is a kind of response to his, his entire uh, sort of education is Silla Pacon, which is, of course, was founded by an Italian sculptor. So finally, uh, I think, again, Professor Clark's deep exegesis of the Indonesian artist FX Hasono's work since the 70s adds a layer to interpretations of what we have presented in the exhibition downstairs. It demonstrates how, in particular, such an artist such as Hasono and and his career can be seen in the context of the multiple renegotiations as to I the ideal nature of what is Indonesian identity, what is the role of minority or hybrid cultures within this larger whole, and of course, the silences that political expediency often enacts upon narratives of violence and exclusion. And we still continue to see his work evolving uh, in ways beyond you know, what, what can even be uh, presented. While his recent work up until now has focused on recuperating almost the subaltern history of the Chinese community in Indonesia, the artist has now also begun investigating a much sort of larger issue of the lost histories of the wider Javanese community, not limited to particular ethnicities necessarily, in, in very specific localities, thereby bringing his concerns, I think, even closer to the point that this commentary started with, an interrogation of who and what constitutes the nation. Thank you. And I encourage you again to read the catalogue. And uh, right now, we have a change of pace. Uh, I mentioned that uh, this afternoon we have um, interventions by artists and inputs by artists. So we are going to, uh, I'm going to introduce the artist Mossad, uh, who's here with us today. So Mossad lives and works in, as an artist and curator in Yangon, Myanmar. Mo started creating art after graduating from East Yangon University in Myanmar with a degree in zoology in 2005. In 08, he founded and organized Beyond Pressure, an international festival of performance art in Myanmar. He has participated in live art festivals throughout Asia and Europe has, and has been invited to be the resident artist in Paris, Stockholm, and New York in, in various venues. His work has been included in several major exhibitions, including the, the Busan Biennial in 2012, the Kafa Biennial in Beijing in 2013, Context, Context and Contestation, Collective Driven Art in Southeast Asia at the CCA, uh, BCCA in Bangkok in 2013, and the Journal of the Plague Year in South Korea 2014. Mozart was a finalist for the Hugo Boss Asia Art Award. So we'll, we'll be uh, seeing the artist's work uh, in, in two items. First, there will be a video, Hands Around Yangon, created in 2012. After that, the artist will perform F&F, &F, Face and Fingers, 2008 and 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, Mozart. Hey, back on 
เป็นตัวอันนั้นมาจ้ะดูดูดูดูเลยดิเดี๋ยวเราไปดูมาดูดิจิทัลที่ที่ทำอะไรกันเนี่ยเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเออเ
ladies and gentlemen, Mozart. We're going to move into our second keynote, uh, and it's by uh, Apinan Pushyananda, the former Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Culture, Thailand. Um, Apinan is a great uh, friend, and you know we've we worked together in Southeast Asia as well as here and. You know, he has a great history with Asia society from a long time ago. Apinan is, of course, an art historian, a critic, an artist, and a curator who has been involved in every biennial under the sun. Uh, the Venice Biennial, the Biennial of Sydney, Istanbul, Liverpool, Yokohama Triennial, and Asia Pacific Triennial. And I've always referred to Apinan as the person that helped all of us in Asia fly the flag in the Big Bad West, so to speak. He was guest curator of the exhibition, the landmark exhibition, Contemporary Art from Asia, Traditions and Tensions, which, of course, was one of the first to introduce contemporary art from Southeast Asia to this country, and Temples of the Mind, among many others. And he has also organized uh, solo exhibitions for Zhang Pei Li, uh, for Araki, for Morimura, and, of course, Marina Abramovich. He is the author of the publication Modern Art in Thailand, West Western style painting and sculpture in the Royal Thai Court, behind Thai Smile, playing with slippery lubricants and Thai Trace, 1868 to 2016. Apinan is the recipient of awards from the National Research Council Bangkok and the governments of France, Italy and uh, Sweden. And it's not mentioned here, but I think he's very very shy and modest. But of course, Apinan is now very busily organizing, you know, the first uh, Bangkok Art Biennial uh, in Bangkok. And, and that will be one of the, you know, landmark things that will happen in the region. So ladies and gentlemen, Apinan Poshyananda. Thank you very much, Bun Hui, uh, and many thanks for the invitation for me to be here at the Asia Society, which I uh, have been attached uh, for for many years. And it's, I'm glad that uh, several of you have uh, been able to work with me, and, and nice of you to be to be here. Um, I. I will start the talk uh, entitled Negotiating Change in Darkness. And I will talk about the projects of uh, traditions, tensions, contemporary art in Asia, as well as uh, the, the post events that came after the traditions, tensions with uh, many Southeast Asian and Asian artists. Uh, so it's like uh, moving back to 1996, where it all started here at the Asian Society. And we would like to give some sort of context of what happened then and what is happening now with After Darkness exhibition, which, by the way, is fantastic. Um, my drunken Japanese friend once advised me in a bar in Tokyo, try taking a shower in the dark with my clothes on. By applying soap in darkness, he said, I could simultaneously wash my body and clothes at the same time. He believed that this would save water and time. This experience proved to be laborious and much patience needed. Pursuance in contemporary Asian art is comparable to taking shower in darkness fully clothed. <laughs> darkness, like lightness, is temporary and can be seen in relative terms. As Japanese author Ajeng Kartini wrote in her letters through Darkness to Light, uh, which became uh, published after the darkness comes the light and has been inspirational for the title of the exhibition After Darkness, Southeast Asian Art in the Wake of History. While 
Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, also written in the late 19th century, captured a different shade of darkness of white supremacy and racism through adventure of European sailors in the jungle among cannibals in the Congo River. In Cambodia, Heart of Darkness is symbolic of trauma and pain. The title evokes images of savagery on a boat ride on the river of death. <laughs> Apocalypse Now, Killing Films are classic films of human horror and consequence of American hunger for war in Indochina. This month, Netflix features First They Killed My Father, a movie depicting atrocities and mass murder during Khmer Rouge era. Through the eyes of Luang, a little girl and her family whose lives were sucked into the abyss of dark doom. Today, darkness before light is precarious situation we are facing not only in Southeast Asia, but worldwide. From tensions in South, South China seas to bombing in Syria, from ISIS threats in Paris, London, Brussels, New York, to mass shooting in Las Vegas, and ethnic cleansing and killings of Muslim Rohingyas. Nuclear tests and name calling of President Trump, a barking dog, by President Kim Ong Yu, has put some tensions on the trauma of the world. We might say that Trump's rhetoric and North Korean crisis is taking the stage whereby American societies, many may say, is muddling through a time of darkness and transience. Darkness in many guises are always lurking, ready to pounce its claws and fangs on victims. We must remember, however, that victims and culprits are sometimes interchangeable. History of colonization in Southeast Asia has caused a vast darkness after, the, after 1945, the colonial era ended. Independence emerged along with forces of modernity, along with fear of Cold War. Authoritarian rule, God King monarchy, traditional elites, military strong manpower, Vietnam War, Khmer Rouge War, nationalism, socialism, communism, all these have been intricate and multi-layered in context of what we call Southeast Asia. Intricate and complex, pale Western, we might call Euro-American stereotype of Asia slash Southeast Asia is often pigeonholed, askewed, and slanted. On the one hand, the region is an exotic paradise glittering temples, sunny beaches, paddy fields, spicy food, cool cocktails, and deep massage. On the other hand, it is the epitome of nepotism, corruption, and debauchery, dictatorship, flesh trade, and narcotics and drug trafficking. Social scientists Political analysts, historians, economists, and writers have published extensively on Southeast Asia. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, some scholars began to ask, is there any contemporary art being made from this region? If so, is it any good? Good meaning that, is it good according to pale Euro-American standard? In those days, talking about dead or living Southeast Asian arts, and their work was like negotiating change in murky areas of darkness that needed patient navigation. In 1992, sitting in this very room in semi-darkness, Dr. Vishaka Desai, who was vice president of the Asian Society, made us sit for three days to discuss about 
contemporary Asian art. And among the survivors is <laughs> Professor John Clark, who, like he said already, that I first met him in 1991 in a seminar at the ANU. Uh, symposium, uh, Asian Modernities, and then I met him again uh, in 1992 with many uh, scholars who became uh, friends for a long, long time now, whether it be uh, Kanaka Sabapathy um, and oh, David Elliott and many more. We discussed about uh, context of what is Asia? What is Southeast Asia? Is there any potentials in contemporary Asian art? After the event, it was like rolling in a black hole. The participants came out dazed and comfortably numb. Nevertheless, they came to realize that there was urgent need to negotiate change in methodology, pedagogy, curatorship, and discourse on contemporary art in Asia. Genealogies of different kinds of art history must be appreciated, meaning that contemporary art in Asia should be seen in a new light. Context of its tradition, history, and art practice must be prioritized. Art names, in those days, very difficult to, to learn art names and artist names, art institutions, and art vocabularies must be learned. Prejudice and stereotype of derivative art, exotic art, and marginalized art needed to be addressed. Could that moment be seen as the wake of Southeast Asian art history, recognized by New York slash American art world and academia? After that meeting, subsequent exhibitions uh, happened. Uh, contemporary Art in Asia, Traditions, Tensions, followed by Inside Out, New Chinese Art, were initiated by the Asia Society. So that should be uh, marked and underlined several times that the attempts of uh, art appreciation of Asia and Southeast Asia happened here, happened right here. And in those days, it, it was very, very difficult but the pursuance and uh, determination of uh, the members of the Asian Society, especially Vishaka Desai, uh, started the ball rolling, as it were. As guest curator for Traditions Tensions, that opened simultaneously at three venues in New York in 1996, here at the Asian Society, Queen's Museum, and Grey Art Gallery and subsequently traveled to Vancouver Art Gallery, Art Gallery of Western Australian Perth, and Taipei Fine Arts Museum. It was, I may say, a mammoth task. During my research, traveling in Asia and making contacts with artists were not easy. This was the era of fax machine and letter writing. iPhone and Facebook were non-existent. Networking relied on local contacts and studio visits. Attending conferences, symp symposiums, and studio visits were essential to understand change and transition. This was the gathering at the non-aligned art movement in Jakarta, which was an emphatic statement about nation members that seek alternative models from Western art discourse. I was able to, to learn much from esteemed scholars, uh, such as Kandaka Sabapathy, Gulam Mohammed Sheikh, Jim Supangat, Gita Kapoor, John Clark, David Elliott, and many more. Now, we had this meeting in Jakarta, and several days later, I had the chance to encounter the President Suharto, who came to open the NAM or Non-Aligned Art Movement exhibition in 1995. And this was the only shot I got of him and the First Lady. Blurred and unfocused in semi-darkness, the camera clicked once before the secu security guard pushed me aside. But I learned later 
that President Suharto went past this installation. Harry Donald's Ceremony of Soul. And prior to the opening of the NAM exhibition, I had gone to Yogyakarta to talk with Harry at his studio, uh, and he allowed me to take this photo in Yogyakarta, and it was later uh, the installation was moved to Jakarta for the, for the exhibition. Harry explained about the use of traditional stones collected near Borobudur site, and the blank robotic eyes on the fiberglasses. He later on decorated the statues with uh, military regalia, decorations, and yellow was used as symbolic of the Golka party. The Golka party was the uh, political power under Suharto for many decades, the party that focused on economic development and stability. On the opening day, Harry Dono's critical message of Golka party through his work nearly got him into trouble. And his criticism of uh, political situations was continuous, and many of his works uh, directly attacked the government, but in many ways, sometimes he managed to be subversive and disguise a lot of his works through satire. But uh, in 1996, this particular work was installed in the gallery downstairs at the Asia Society for the Traditions Tensions Exhibition. The work actually then captured the precarious political moment and anticipated what was to come in later troubled years. In 1997, Indonesia was hit by financial financial crisis, Tom Yam Kung, which began in Bangkok. And in 1998, the anti-government protests and riots forced Suharto to resign from presidency. And at that time, the exhibition Tradition Sentience was traveling with the Ceremony of Seoul on tour in Australia and Taipei. Tensions between socially engaged art and spectacle were evident in several works in the exhibition tradition tensions. Here in the slightly more, uh, in the lighter manner, the inflatable yellow peak, not live peak of course, uh, by Che Chung Kwa, was placed above uh, the Hindu deities of the Rockefeller collection. This is at the entrance of the Asia Society. The Asia Society might have, at the time, seen it as, as harmless, but uh, interpreted wrongly, it could have been offensive to Muslim visitors, including Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mahathir Mohamad, who came as a special speaker at this institution. Muntian Bunma, uh, Temple of Mind, Arokaya Sala, stacks of metal lungs covered with medicinal herbs placed precariously and ready to collapse. This was also installed downstairs. Or Evex Hasono, the severe Wayang Kulit mask with speechless mouths, along with Dadang Cristanto's performance with traditional terracotta heads being smashed by baseball bats, where he performed in at the Grey Art Gallery as well as the Vancouver Art Gallery. Araya Rajam Ransuk, crushed female body, entrapped in coffin-like enclosure, play with female torso as space to convey unbearable message that later led her to experiment with corpses in morgues in her videos. Tension in darkened space by Riamilo, Riamilo Riamilo and Juliet at Queen's Museum showed godlike icon of President Ferdinand Marcos with crucifix crucifixes formed out of M16 machine guns, together with jars of balut and born duck eggs. Slogans screened on the walls read pro, gone, pro, pro God, pro gun, pro life. Ariamani's performance. Uh, she performed at the Brisbane uh, Second 
uh, Artership Pacific Triennial, as well as perform in New York, where she created the body, la body language against uh, Muslim doctrine, as well as against the traditions of Japanese dance. Now, coverage of the New York Times promoted Cha Chai Pui Pia's Siamese smile, as well as Rav Ravinder Reddy's head as brand images of traditional tensions. You see here the, the opening day uh, at the gallery downstairs where Reddy showed his, his beautiful head, the head that became uh, so familiar to us uh, in later years. Later on in 2010, I commissioned Reddy to, to make a larger head at the public uh, space at Central World Bangkok, where it was to be permanently installed to celebrate King Pumipon Adunyadet's 80th anniversary. And the sculpture was sponsored by Central Group as well as Thai Indian Chamber of Commerce. But a few weeks of official, after the official opening, Reddy's head metamorphosed. Its meaning changed so much almost overnight. There were riots by the red shirts in 2010, and there was a lot of burning. And this image became so potent all over the world. The burning took place and people misinterpreted it, especially the red shirts who were uh, demonstrating and gathering there and saw Reddy's head as bad omen, as Durga or Kali and almost you know, defaced and wrote many uh, bad things on, on the sculpture. After a few days, the wreckage of the Scorch shopping mall, the stench of plastic, clothes and flesh, bullet marks and spray paints were evident. This was in the middle of Bangkok by the central world. And many of you may know that this is the, the, the heart of the shopping area in Bangkok. Negotiating change at that time had another level of menacing meaning. Intention of Reddy's head as public celebration was misinterpreted and attacked as symbol of hatred and terror. Some went as far as to believe that the burning was the result of bad omen, as I mentioned. Sadly, the head had to be removed, and after repair, it was placed nearby, but not so prominent space, and it still can be seen today, placed among the Hindu deities that are being respected. Last month, I came across, by accident, a photo taken by Jacques Kurtz entitled Incident at the Central World Shopping Mall on the 20th of May 2010 at the Institut Francais in Paris. You see here firemen pouring water over the wreckage near Reddy's head. So after the Tradition Tension Exhibition and the popularity of works by uh, artists such as Reddy, it, it had many, many consequences, uh, good and bad. Uh, and here, Navin Raban Chaigun, the, one of the youngest participants in the Tradition Tensions exhibitions, created murals, uh, now installed at uh, Mai Iam Museum in Chiang Mai. This is the detail that recorded changes in Thai politics and art scene, where he included Reddy's head as part of political turmoil in Thai turbulent history. Now, despite the social political events in Southeast Asia, the conceptual framework of tradition sentience seems still not outdated 
Naturally, many of us have moved on. Sadly, Bupen Kakra and Montien Bunma are no longer with us. But in September, I had the chance to, to meet both FX Hasono and Harry Dono at the Jakarta Art Stage. It was a brief but very happy reu reunion, and we chatted about old times, agreeing that traditions, tensions still lives on. Back in 1996 in New York, negotiation with artists was important process of change. Artists, as you know, can be very sensitive and delicate, but most times negotiable. During our installation process for traditions tensions in New York in 1996, we managed to find time to discuss and negotiate in dark corners with dark beers, Guinness especially, in Manhattan bars. This is a memorable photo of one of those negotiable nights where Montin Bunma would always lead the conversation for challenging topics such as how far we have come and it was limelight at the end of the dark tunnel. Chachai Puipia and Kamon Pausawat and Nawin Rawan Chaikun would join in. Whereas Che uh, Chung whose back you see at the front of the photo, would always pass out every night, and it was our duty to carry him back to his room. <laughs> After Tradition Tensions, I had the chance to curate solo exhibitions by Montin Bunma, which also uh, was shown here, uh, called Temple of the Mind, and they traveled to uh, San Francisco, uh, as well as ANU in, in Canberra, and also the solo show by Harry Dono, which uh, you see here, the installation. The exhibition was the first solo show by Dono in Japan, entitled Bizarre Dalang, Japanese Bricolo Low-Tech Wizard in 2000. It was staged at the Japan Foundation. It was a time towards the end of the Goka party dominance in Indonesia. Certainly plenty of negotiation took place as we transported Dono's major works from his studio in Jakarta to Tokyo. Several works were large-scale installations related to his critique on the ruling party. Others were satirical and critical of Goka party and government. While FX Hasono performed Destruction in 1997 as Ravana and Demon King in a business suit and his face painted during the reformacy, followed by burned victims in 1998 to reflect violence of victims who were burned alive in the mall. Both works you can see downstairs. Harry Dono acted himself as Dalang, the Wayang Kulit puppeteers on several occasions. Also provocative works such as Interrogation, made in 1998, showed video of prisoners under tight scru scru scrutiny with toy machine guns pointed at them, accompanied by gamelan music with Dono acting as shadow puppeteer master. Dono's first solo exhibition in Japan opened many unhealed wounds of the time of fear and terror. The photo you see here is of the Dadan Cristanto on, on, the, on your left. Uh -huh. This was during the critical years that uh, I had the chance in 1997 to visit him in Jogjagata, where I was curating the show called Anthropophagia, Cannibalism, for the Sao Paulo Biennale. I visited Dadang uh, at his home, and he was in the middle of making uh, this work, uh, the offer evidence, which we took to show at the Sao Paulo Biennale. These uh, large, larger than size, ghost like nudes stood in rows, carrying burned clothes as if witnessing riots, looting, and arson. The Dan Cristante was under enormous pressure as he made these figures. Harassed and threatened, he changed from religion, from Christianity to Muslim, in hope that his life and family 
would not be endangered. And later on, I learned that he moved uh, to settle in Darwin, in Australia. In retrospect, uh, this photo is, is of the tradition sanctions that travel to the Vancouver Art Gallery. In retrospect, reviews and critical writing on tradition sanctions were mixed. The exhibition at three venues in New York was ambitious, but as expected, New York audience was not ready to grasp the theme and the conceptual framework of the display. Despite two full-page articles in the New York Times, special issue of Art Asia Pacific, and articles in Art News and Art Forum, some critical reviews concern issues of derivation, marginal marginalization, and too political. It was during the tour to Vancouver, Perth, and Taipei, however, that tradition tensions gained critical acclaim in Canada and Asia and Australia. Now, 20 years have passed. Tensions remain. Tradition tensions seem to have a life of its own. As part of a discourse in Asian art studies, this exhibition has been used as case studies and part of many curriculum in studies in Asia as well as Southeast Asia. The catalog has been translated into Chinese, Thai, and Bahasa, and many works have been focused uh, individually. For example, here, uh, the sculpture by Agnes Arellano, uh, where she used uh, the Muchalinda Buddha, the collection of the Rockefeller here, but transverse it showed in such a way of her self-portrait as uh, the female Buddha with multiple breasts. Or the work by uh, Nalini Malini, the use of uh, traditional gouache, but reflecting uh, femininity, uh, female space in, in Mumbai. Uh, by the way, Nalini is now uh, having a, a big show at the Pompidou Center in Paris. Also, uh, Kim Suja, who's uh, very active, uh, and now she's participated in many shows, including Documenta and Venice Biennale. Or the work by uh, Imelda Kajib and Daya, showing loaded luggage, symbolic of migration, refugee, and overseas workers. Her early works is still you know, very, very uh, contemporary and may uh, have many messages of what we are facing today. So artists are receiving a lot of recognition, but as well as uh, being able to, to show at uh, uh, Biennale's art fairs, uh, art stage in Singapore, or art stage in Jakarta, or many are involved in the Asia Contemporary Art Week in New York. Uh, I congratulate Tyler Rollins Fine Arts, who has, Tyler has dedicated 10 years on contemporary Southeast Asian art, and uh, he's, he's done such a, a great endeavor for, for Thai, as well as uh, Southeast Asian uh, artists. He's, he's here with us today, as well as the uh, activities uh, by the Sundaram Tagore Gallery. Uh, Sundaram has shown uh, many Southeast Asian art, and now he is uh, exhibiting contemporary Thai art, uh, the exhibition called Heads or Tales, Uncertainties and Tensions in Contemporary Thailand. So, despite lingering darkness in some areas of Southeast Asia, I foresee optimistically that the future is bright. Bright showering light at the end of dimly lit tunnels. 20 years have passed since the opening of Traditions Tensions that held its opening right here. The pursuance of Southeast Asian art has been enriching through sinuous multiple layers. New emerging curators and scholars have arrived on the scene. Exciting exhibitions such as Bangkok Art Biennale, Thailand Biennale, and Bangkok Biennial are taking place next year. No longer do we have to grope for soap in the dark. 
at least I can tell my drunken Japanese friend that concerning contemporary Southeast Asian art, I can take a shower in brightness with my clothes fully off. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pashyananda, for that very enlightening and also very uh, uh, enjoyable presentation. Um, I'd like to take the next few minutes to respond to Dr. Pashyananda's points. Um, but first, I'd like to thank him again for taking the time to join us today for this symposium. It's really such an honor to have you um, participate with us, uh, especially you know, looking back at 20 years from traditions tensions, um, which was so important uh, in the discourse of contemporary Southeast Asian and, and Asian art. I also wanted to also take a moment to also recognize Vishaka Desai, who is our former museum director director and president of Asia Society, who presciently had the vision to incorporate Asian and Asian American contemporary art into the programming at Asia Society. It was a very forward-thinking move on her part, and I think we can see the fruits of that, not only in New York, but you know across uh, the United States and beyond. Um, so I think, you know, in listening to Dr. Pashinanda's uh, presentation and thinking about my own position as a curator, a number of questions come to mind in terms of, you know, where we are now, looking, you know, forward 20 years from Traditions Tension, seeing what doors that exhibition opened up, you know, how as curators, and specifically from my position um, as a curator who focuses on contemporary art from Asia, yet sits here primarily on the Upper East Side in New York, how does one um, create a viable context in which one can really kind of dig into and, and elaborate on the nuances that are being um, discussed and uh, elaborated on within contemporary art in Asia, while also providing a context, uh, a light enough context um, for audiences here who may not have the intimate um, understanding that uh, local audiences might have. Um, I think a number of issues uh, came up in, you know, during the course of Dr. Pashinanda's discussion, I mean, thinking about agency and the position of the narrative, thinking about the idea of history and the relativity of history. Whose history are we trying to portray and deconstruct, and who is the one that's telling the history? Um, and I think that's something as um, curators or as scholars we constantly need to be mindful of and sensitive to, um, and think, you know, understanding that there are multiple narratives. I mean, in my relative a short period at Asia Society. You know, I've worked on many exhibitions here where we've been really trying to illuminate and deconstruct this idea of multiple modernities or multiple narratives so that there was not, you know, I think coming from a Western art perspective from my education, um, thinking about this idea of a linear construction of the development of art and really kind of... Um, you know, reinforcing this idea that there are multiple points of entry and there are multiple directions that you can take these ideas and issues from. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Pashyananda also brings up the important point of um, the relationship of contemporary art to socio-political events um, and issues, and that's something that I think in large part we are not able to divorce the work from. And so I think being able to adequately contextualize um, the socio-political moment in which the works are being made in a sensitive and objective way um, is very important uh, when putting together exhibitions. Um, this issue of um, you know, regionalization or the perspective from outside, um, outside versus inside in this, you know, um, especially for 
again, somebody, I'm speaking very personally as uh, from my response, somebody coming from the West, how do you um, maintain a deep and ongoing relationship and dialogue with the work that's being made in Southeast Asia or, you know, across Asia while maintaining one's roots here? And how do you constantly negotiate that without f- seeming like a helicopter curator who kind of swoops in from time to time and like does these kind of rapid fire studio visits to um, develop a project? I mean, how does one, and these are questions I would love to discuss further, you know, uh, during the reception period, you know, how how does one um, maintain relationships. I mean, I think one successful strategy of traditions tensions and that's been employed with other exhibitions, large exhibitions, is this idea of developing a quorum and bringing in experts from all over and having dialogues and really kind of hashing out the issues. And it may be very messy. And as Dr. Pashinanda said, you know, the end of this three-day sequesterment, you know, ended up in this kind of dizzying numbness, but, you know, probably also very exhilarating with this exchange of ideas and this thinking about different ways of of, of talking about the work. Um, and I think, um, you know, this idea of... Uh, tradition. You know, when we think about Western art movements, we think about this idea of um, breaking away from tradition and breaking away from the past. And, you know, I think with tradition's tensions and with um, some of the works that are included in our current exhibition, After Darkness, you see an engagement with tradition, that you're not shying away or divorcing oneself, but that you are thinking about it in a nuanced and maybe often transgressive or subversive way, but you're not, um, you're taking that history with you. And I think that's an important point to remember, um, but also thinking about it in a way that, you know, it's not uh, derivative or it's not kind of, um, it's using the traditional material as another form of appropriation, I think, if you want to think about it in that kind of contemporary term. Um, I think also, to this idea of um, agency and authenticity or kind of the idea of, you know, Dr. Pashinanda was from Southeast Asia when he was invited to um, curate the Traditions Tensions Exhibition. So thinking about how um, this idea of um, again, you know, your perspective, how that can affect the successful negotiation of the um, deconstruction and kind of representation of these works. Um, I think also, too, thinking about, again, in the terms of sociopolitical sensitivities, many contemporary artists um, in many countries um, in Southeast Asia and in other areas of the world, you know, are working in quite contentious situations. And how do we as curators and as scholars consider the work, um, but also being sensitive to the artists' um, practices and their own um, kind of security in some cases. Um, but And also thinking it um, in terms about you know who their audience is, and in some cases, some of the work that these artists are creating are not able to be shown in their local communities. And so, what does that mean? And thinking about audience, who is the intended audience for the work um, when it's taken out of its local context? How does the reading and the understanding of the work shift? Um, and I'm hoping in our next panel that we can address some of those issues as well. Thinking about um, one's location and one's um, one's perspective, I guess, and one's, I mean, you know, when we think about contemporary artists, they can be very nomadic. I mean, there's numerous residencies or, you know, opportunities for artists to live abroad and to choose their own locality. And so in that kind of opportunity, you know, what does that mean in terms of one's uh, point of origin or one's perspective, um, this issue of hybridity, this issue of, um, you know, 
uh, perspective, I guess. So these are just some questions that I thought that I would raise um, that came to my mind from Dr. Pashinanda's wonderful presentation. Um, so with that, I think we will take um, a 15-minute break. Um, and then followed by the break, um, we will hold our last session of the day, which is the Changing Role of Artists in Society, which will be a panel discussion um, featuring Din Kyu Lei, Mo Sot, who we saw a little bit earlier, and Tin Tin Wulia. Um, each of the artists will give a 10-minute presentation, followed by, by a moderated discussion. Thank you. So the final program, uh, for, so the, the final session for our program today is the changing role of artists in society, which will be a panel discussion with Din Kule, Mo Sot, and Tin Tin Wulia. Each of the artists will provide a short presentation on their work, followed by a moderated discussion with me about how their respective practices reflect and respond to many of the socio-political issues that have arisen both in their respective communities and in the larger world. Um, it will also think about their larger role as artists outside the traditional definition. Um, the first speaker for this session will be Din Kyu Le. Lei was born in Ha Tien, Vietnam, and immigrated with his family to the United States in 1978, where he remained until his return to Vietnam in 1993. Lei is interested in the role of memory in relation to personal and societal trauma, especially in the wake of the American Vietnam War and the ongoing plight of boat refugees around the world due to sociopolitical upheavals. He is one of the artists in our exhibition, so hopefully you'll have an opportunity after the program to take a look at uh, his work on view. The second speaker for this session will be Mo Sot, who many of you saw earlier in the program. Mo Sot lives and works as an artist and curator in Yangon, Myanmar. He started creating art after graduating from East Yangon University in Myanmar in a with a degree in zoology in 2005. In 2008, he founded and organized Beyond Pressure, which is an international festival of performance art in Myanmar. And the final speaker for this program will be Tintin Wulia. Wulia was born in Bali, Indonesia, and is now based in Brisbane, Australia. She is an Indonesian artist of ethnic Chinese descent whose work focuses on the idea of how borders enact identities and the motivations and constraints surrounding border crossings, whether voluntary or forced. So please join me in welcoming Din Kyu Le to the podium for the first presentation. The screen, we need the screen now. Um, well, thank you very much for helping me back here at Asia Society again. Um, so it's always a pleasure to be part of Asia Society program. Um, oh, it's going to be on that? Oh, OK. OK. Um, OK. <laughs> so it's a little bit kind of changing my. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about moving back to Vietnam and how that change influenced the way I work and how it changed my, uh, my, strat uh, my, my way of working. Um, now, I moved back. Uh, I first came back to Vietnam after 15 years of growing up here in America from the age of 10 to 25. I moved back. I visited Vietnam for the first time in 93. Now, uh, I'm from the South, so I came and uh, I went back to Vietnam primarily to visit Saigon. And uh, there was pretty much nothing there in terms of contemporary art. Uh, there's um, traditional uh, uh, kind of Fren French train school type of painting still going on there. And the whole scene was pretty much controlled by the Fine Art Association, which is uh, run by the uh, government appointed uh, uh, um, uh, artists. 
And so as somebody, and you have to be invited to be part of that, by the way. And as somebody who coming back, uh, I definitely was not invited nor welcome. <laughs> so, uh, so it, uh, and also at that time, contemporary art, uh, maybe not contemporary art, but the new form from video, photo based work, uh, installation was not recognized by the Fine Art Association. And it was dismissed by the Fine Art Association as something that if you want to get a residency abroad, that's what you have to do in order to, but it's, they don't count it as something, uh, of something uh, uh, credible. So anyway, but so visit, uh, coming, growing up here in America, these are the images of Vietnam. And, uh, but these are images that I know of, and it doesn't exist here in the mass media here in Vietnam. And so I think for me, there's so many narratives that have been left out. And it doesn't reflect my experience. And growing up here, going to school here, always frustrated me. Somebody is always writing the Vietnam history and my history, and yet it doesn't reflect anything that I experienced. So there was a kind of frustration. But when I moved back to Vietnam, there was another frustration because the Vietnam War, in many ways, was also a civil war between the North and the South. And, of course, the, I'm from the South, and the communist Vietnamese Northern government, after taking over the South, tried to erase the history of the South because it contradicted with their narrative. And so books were burned. Um, uh, many of the artwork were not included in the, the museum. Uh, and, but the one thing are uh, these photographs. They could not uh, erase this photograph. They are documentation of the South. And they are documentation of my experience that they could not erase. And so I start collecting them. As you see, this is my collection. They're quite large. And, uh, and also, they became a very important documentation of the part of history of the South that, that I um, felt there was a need to preserve, to protect, before it be, uh, being erased. And so over the years, I've been amassed a lar very large collection of, of this vernacular photography, of everyday photograph, but also they are a kind of record of a kind of happiness. Because most of the time, we document those moments uh, when we, f we, we, we want to preserve them because they're moments of happiness. And so they are also a kind of very different idea of Vietnam. So there are moments of happiness, even during the Vietnam War and everything. And so that was, so this photograph became very uh, important and it, it, it became part of the many works over the years, but uh, sadly I'm not going to talk about it here, but <laughs> because uh, we don't have time. But so this is uh, the work that I usually do from Vietnam to Hollywood. These are large photographic weavings that are photographs from different sources from uh, still from Vietnam, uh, from Hollywood film about the Vietnam War to uh, foreign journalists uh, documented the Vietnam War. Um, and then I tried to insert the uh, vernacular photography that I've been collecting into this photograph. So they became a, uh, the, so this work became a kind of tapestries of uh, facts and fiction, and everything can merge in and out. And in a way, it, it talk about a kind of memory uh, that we are kind of experiencing about the Vietnam War. So, so that, that's the work I've done, mostly. And then in, uh, in 2005, uh, I, through the helps of my uh, art dealer in LA, uh, Shoshana and Wayne Blank, uh, we set up a Vietnam Foundation for the Arts. 
Um, at that time, there was nothing in terms of contemporary art, or there was a lack of information about contemporary art in, in Saigon. In Hanoi, there were more because of the embassy, the foreign embassy were there, the NGOs were there, so there was more funding, so there's more information coming in, but Saigon, there was very little. Not, uh, pretty much nothing. And so the first thing I thought was let's just open a one-room library. And so that was the impetus to start this. this uh, but then uh, it was very difficult to kind of open a space like that under the very strict uh, Vietnamese communist government uh, program uh, rule also. So uh, what we did was we, uh, Vietnam Foundation put our uh, we asked a, uh, um, a group of very uh, generous collectors of my work who actually were, uh, became uh, um, patron of Asia Society and now Melissa who sort of took them to uh, the hair showing. Uh, but we, we actually introduced uh, them to Melissa. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so Melissa was on board uh, Melissa Chu was on board, um, and a, a few museum directors were on board. And so these donors would put money in there, and we would bring international uh, artists, curators, historians to come to Vietnam, to fly into Hanoi, and organize a talk at uh, Hano uh, Hanoi U Fang Art University. And if we came to Saigon, they, and then they would also all, uh, host a talk and meet with the artists and the community and discuss uh, and get to know contemporary Vietnamese art, but also for the Vietnamese artists to get to know what's going on between the, what's happening in outside. And now it all this sort of came out as a necessity. Uh, I think for me, it was important to build a community. Uh, I was feeling very isolated in Vietnam. Uh, and I think the, the young artists who also experienced with the, all this new form felt extremely isolated. Uh, and so we, I, I felt the need to build a community where we could all come together and support each other. And so that's how the Vietnam Foundation for Art uh, begins. Um, and then it will change shapes later on, but even today it's still acting as a fiscal sponsor for another uh, organization that, that we started under uh, Vietnam Foundation for the Art. Um, and while trying to do this, I'm still trying to be an artist as well. Uh, and uh, so the first work uh, that really sort of changed the way I work was uh, the Farmers and Helicopter. And this work, uh, I start to interview people. But again, out of a kind of uh, necessity, our kind of frustration. Uh, over the years, our narratives have always been uh, written by others. And these people never have the platform uh, to speak for themselves, never have the chance to speak for themselves. No one give them the platform to speak for themselves. And so uh, it's, um, the, the, the work start with these two uh, farmers. One is a farmer, one is a self-taught um, mechanic who decide to build all these helicopters uh, from scratch. And um, they, uh, because they saw this helicopter during the Vietnam War as a child, and they fell in love with it. And now they're growing up, and they want to uh, make these helicopters uh, for kind of farming, uh, to help with the farming, but to help with emergency evacuation. So in a, in a very kind of humanistic way, they're trying to turn this <coughs> machine of death into a machine th that would help people. So it's, uh, it's a very kind of old story in a way. And so I started interview, interview them and interview many of their uh, relatives, some of the uh, the relatives, uh, his, their relatives, and they all talk about their memory of the Vietnam War, 
uh, of the helicopter, the first encounter, and the strategies that they came up with to deal with the helicopter during the Vietnam War. And then to talk about what their envision of a helicopter today. And, and it's quite interesting how they have changed it. Uh, and so this was uh, installed at uh, MoMA. And now MoMA actually owns that helicopter now. And then the film. So, uh, so that's, that's the film. And we are able to bring the helicopter builder to New York as well. And uh, the Asian Cultural Council, the trustee of, of Asian Cultural Council, actually organize a helicopter ride for uh, for the uh, helicopter <laughs> builder to see uh, to see uh, Manhattan from a helicopter view because he he doesn't know how to fly the helicopter and so they just built the helicopter and never really fly it <laughs> and, and so it's quite fun but that this this uh, idea of, of creating platform for people to kind of talk about their experiences, led to the open up sand art. There was a need for a place for y to kind of train the younger generation of artists to be critical about their, their what, to, to, to kind of look at their society, their, their community in a critical way. And, and this doesn't exist. The, the education in Vietnam and the fine art education in Vietnam is extremely problematic. Uh, it's, um, it doesn't teach you how to look at things critically. It just asks you to accept what is given to you. And, uh, and this is under communism, so it's quite understandable. Uh, so we start to create uh, this uh, place, not only for us to get together, to build a community, but also to teach them, to give them the tool, and to give them the space to experiment with uh, uh, all these new forms that they're, they're trying to uh, kind of uh, testing out. And so this is one of the, our show. But you know, as we became very successful, uh, we also became under the spotlight of the Ministry of Culture, and we were censored quite a lot. Uh, and so this is one of the, the show, uh, one of the show that, that got censored. But, you know, under censorship, we find way around it. Uh, there's always strategy. So it doesn't sound as bad or as terrible. And I think sometimes it led us to a very creative way to deal with uh, censorship. Like this show, we apply for 10 photographs. And the uh, permission came back. Nine were censored, and only one were allowed. So I told um, my director at that time, just hang it all up, photograph it the way we wanted, and then take it all down. And uh, so this is the opening. So you have one photograph, and everything is blank. But we underneath the, 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 where the work should be hanged, we put a sign that said, this work was not allowed. And, uh, we also put the, the paperwork from the Ministry of Culture, and we display it. And of course, the Ministry and the uh, Culture Police were very upset, and they came, and they were, but you know, I was like, within the law, I did what exactly they said, and we have to explain why there's only one painting on the wall. <laughs> one, uh, and so that, that was very important to, to find strategies and to be, part of a community and, and kind of support each other and find way to deal with the very strict censorship law in Vietnam. And so these, we also uh, have a studio program where many young artists went through six months of training, intensive training with us. We give them critical feedback uh, and uh, we staged their exhibition at the end of after six month program. Sadly, we ran out of money now, <laughs> so we can't do that now. But the next year, we are training young curators. Uh, our space has become such a kind of uh, under the spotlight of the government so much that now today we decide to 
train the next generation curator so they can go out there and open their institutions and do exhibition and take care of the young artists. And so the spotlight, well now, you know, instead of just sand art, there's 10 other people are doing it. So they get a little bit more busy. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that's the, I think the point for us is just to uh, find, keep a way of moving. And this is also, we do a lecture series as well. One of our biggest lectures, uh, uh, the attendee was like 300 people. And it's a mathematician who talk about create, what uh, creativity under, uh, in his research. Uh, and 300 people turned out, we didn't have enough space, so we have to put a monitor outside the theater in order for, for people to see it. Um, but, um, so these are some of the, and then in 2012, 2011, um, Carolyn Kristoff, the documentary curator, asked me to participate, and I look at that history also. Uh, during the Vietnam War, no curator thought to come to Vietnam and ask the Vietnamese artists in Vietnam to participate in the show and show them what's happening in Vietnam. But during that, in the 60s and 70s, many, many uh, South American artists, North American artists, European artists uh, participate in documenta, make sh work about the Vietnam War. And yet there was like, nobody thought that maybe we should come to Vietnam <laughs> and ask them to, to uh, participate and tell us their story. So uh, I, I thought uh, maybe it's time. And so I asked 11 of senior Vietnamese artists who participate during the Vietnam War and participate in, um, uh, in the show with me. So we, uh, this is uh, the installation of Documenta, which is a uh, a, a different version of it is now downstairs. Um, and uh, so we, uh, I interview 11 uh, senior artists who were part of the Vietnam War and trying to understand why they do these drawings uh, in the way they do, because most of these drawings have no violence in there. Uh, what usually we expect uh, from from artists when they're documenting war, are the violence and uh, are there? But with these, that no violence. It look almost like they are on a kind of summer camp. <laughs> uh, you get glimpses of the Vietnam uh, of the war. The guns are there, but they're quite uh, and so they're quite um, kind of idealist. Yeah. And so I want to understand it. And it turned out that many of these people have been in the war for so long that they didn't want to see any more violence anymore. They want a kind of escape, something, something beyond the war. And so that, that's why this drawing were the way they are. And so for me, it was important to give them a platform to talk about their, their work instead of me trying to curate the show. And so the video became extremely important uh, in the work. So anyway, so then I did an, a kind of 360 turn. Uh, I make uh, a work about also another artist who completely disenchanted with the war, disenchanted with the communist government in the 60s and the 70s. He was a very high-ranking Communist Party member. And, um, and then he res sort of resigned from it all and make this wonderful kind of figurative but abstract work that, uh, that if you were part of the, if you live in Hanoi at that time under the uh, communist regime at that time, this kind of work, you would have been sent to the kind of the countryside to kind of uh, atone for your s being contaminated by Western abstraction. <laughs> That's, but somehow he was able to survive and able to make this work simply by kind of represent him as somebody who's going crazy, represent himself as somebody who's crazy. And that was a way to get 
how uh, 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 the censorship that he was under uh, from the, 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 the peer pressure that that uh, would have caused. And so he, everybody thought he was crazy and he was happily accept that position. <laughs> And so, and so uh, sadly, he passed away. So I was only ad- able to interview his friends and uh, his widow, to 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 kind of give him uh, to to give him a, a kind of portraits of him. And so, um, for me, it was kind of important to create this kind of platform to bring forth these voices that that have been kind of ignored or not uh, people have not been. Um, allowed to, to, to come forth because Deng Trung Tinh in Vietnam, uh, because he resigned from the Communist Party, and even today his work is not in the Fine Art Museum, it's not collected, even though it's collected by a lot of other people. And simply because to recognize him in that way is to accept the fact that he publicly uh, resigned from the Communist Party in 1975, right after the war, which is quite um, um, controversial. Anyway, but okay, so one last project, and this is just kind of, I, I, I move uh, uh, outside of Vietnam. I was asked to go to uh, Yangon uh, and um, to work at the, this is the supposedly by, should be finished renovation by now, but it's not, I heard, <laughs> the, the new Goethe Institute in Yangon. And I was asked to come before uh, the renovation begin and do a project. And I did some research, and it turned out this, this house was uh, the headquarter of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's father, uh, anti-fascist uh, 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 party. Uh, that was the headquarter, and she used to, as a baby, she was living, he was living in the back, uh, and she was a child around one or two years old living in the back. And, uh, but one thing that I, I was with kind of being in that house, you always want, kind of want to know what kind of political conversation took place there. It must have been amazing just to be the fly on the wall. Uh, and so I start researching a little bit, and, and uh, on San Suu Kyi's father, General Onsen, Onsen, he travel around the country and meet with a diverse group of uh, people from from the re- uh, from what we know now today as Myanmar. But before that, it's just a group of uh, uh, small little kingdoms that the British sort of kind of put together as a country. And so he asked all of them what would it take, what, what do they envision for a modern independent Burma from uh, the British. And so right before he could take uh, the position as um, the, um, the um, president or, or prime minister of Burma, he was assassinated. And that vision was never carried out. And we don't, because, and then also the censorship, we never know what, what that vision is clearly. And so I asked uh, 11 uh, activists uh, collectively, ele- uh, they share around 70 years of imprisonment by the mil- mil- military government. So it's quite an amazing group. And we didn't know whether they would come, but they did, uh, except one. Uh, and so we organize a dinner, and the audience are now the fly, then they can listen to this conversation about what this activist believe, uh, thinks of General Unsang's uh, vision of a modern independent Burma should be. And so we have uh, quite a bit. And, uh, and then the following day, all the dinner and everything, the food, just left on there. And, and because it's an unrenovated place yet, um, we sort of let the bird come in and the rats come in <laughs> and sort of, a, sort of kind of show a kind of disruption, a trauma that took place that, that, uh, that um, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. Hello. 
Yeah, I'm very glad to take part in this symposium, and also like the yeah, this is also kind of the like the about the Saudi Asia art, and yeah, like the 15 years ago or 10 years ago, if they make a Saudi Asia, art, we never get invitation. So this is a <laughs> get the chance to take part. So yeah, I would like to uh, introduce myself as a Mozart. So. Mosa means Myanmar is a raindrop in Myanmar language. So because I born in rainy season and that's why I choose the my name is a Mosa. Because in Myanmar like the most of the artists we have uh, two names. We have a real name and if if, if we become artists we have to choose our own name. So this is also the kind of the the trend from the living under the dictatorship and socialist era. So not the artists they don't want to show their own identity and yeah so and then you can be easy to hide yeah so is is it kind of applies to the arrested or something like that so my generation also followed that the thing so so that's why if you become the artist you choose your name yeah own artist name so yeah the as in the in South Asia like the Contemporary art emerged in the nineties, also in Myanmar. Also, the our first the generation of co contemporary artists emerged in the nineties. Uh, so after the uh, long period of the living the hardcore the dictatorship, nineteen sixty to nineteen eighty eight. So yeah, so I myself is a kind of the second generation of contemporary artists who emerged in the after year 2000. So I would like to share one of mine, the, the ongoing project. So that's what I started uh, developing since last year. So I make a cocktail with the, the drink related with the uh, Myanmar history. So I I making the cote and sharing and talking about the the history of Myanmar, like British colony and Japanese colony and like the military time and the non transition period. Yeah, we used to live over hundred year under the British rule. Yeah, so this is a uh, the postcard of the Pegu class in. 910, yeah, so the Pegu class is a um, gentleman class in the in, in, in Myanmar. So that, so the why is the Pegu? Because uh, like the, when the British uh, colonized, so they divided the, 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 the three or four division, so Pegu division, and the Sanindai division, and Arakan division, next to the Bangladesh, and yeah, so the, the Aori division. So Yangon is a uh, under the uh, Bagu division. So this is a one uh, bit class. The so this is also the a uh, famous the the club in South Asia during the uh, British colony time. Is it the old mind the uh, German? So from that cote, so they have a one signature cote name called Pegu Club. <coughs> Yeah, so this is a recipe of the Pegu Club. So like the gin and orange curacao and lime and angustua there. So yeah, the one I talk about the like the British colony. So like the gin is very, very British. Yeah, so you know they got the they got that kind of ingredient from during the uh, colony time, some spy from the India and yeah, so. So that's why I choose to make the drink to the audience. So this is a can call the Koti. It's called the, this is from the Manali Gazette. This is in eighty eighty five. So yeah, this is advertisement of the Manali Ren. So Manali is a the at that time they have a palace and then so when before the British came. So. 
So British print to the Indian the uh, uh, merchants to produce the ran in 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 Myanmar. So yeah, before that in our our country they, we only have a kind of the local local or the wine. So like the making the making the alcohol is like a there's a, like a, a what the uh, fermentation and uh, distillation. So before British came, we only know the uh, fermentation. Yeah, so we didn't know the process of the distillation. So the run is very the. They start uh, uh, the that Mandalay run produced a year after the uh, British uh, colony. So 1980. So you can see the Mandalay run since 1886. So this is the first uh, and second is so the bellies or the Mandalay bellies. And then the cote is called the Buffett Mandalay. So this is based with the Mandalay run and uh, the spicy actually and the the uh, what the strawberry syrup and then they thought up with the with the Sprite. So the day of that run is like the hot and sweet, yeah? So that's also kind of referred to the the place of the Mandalay, yeah? So it's Mandalay is in the, in the drying zone, so a big hot, yeah? So... And then, yeah, after the British and also in in, in between the British, so that we have uh, like three, three to four years, the Japanese colony time. But that that period, I need to be developed more. So uh, yeah, so this is um, the the terror of the Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, she got the ninety six ruby from Myanmar merchants for her wedding present. Yeah, so it's it's Myanmar. If, uh, we have a lot of the ruby land. Yeah. So later I found out the very interesting the uh, thing is the cooking book is the trade of it. So he visit to the Pacific Island. So this is the original recipe of the Rangoon ruby. So the the vodka and cranberry juice and yeah. So like the when you see the uh, like a. Uh, um, in Cote from 1960, they have a lot of the Cote missing with the cranberry juice. I don't know why, maybe it's, it's the um, 60, they have a uh, cranberry is popular. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, the, yeah, after the long period of the, um, like one decade after the, we got independent, there's a military rule the uh, our country. So that's why if we talk about the Myanmar history, we have to, we should talk about the uh, military. So that, that photo is the 1988, the Abrazin. So, yeah, in the, in the military, they have a one, they have own, own drink. So it's only produced for their soldier, so not for the market, but we can buy in the black market. So I make the one of my cote name with the uh, Bama Army cote since 1962. So you can see the the army ran and the cranberry juice and contra and thought that with the yeah. So yeah. So the after the that long period or the. Uh, military time, so we have now the transition period. So this is like the called uh, democratic time. So this this uh, this cote is especially the uh, American cote, but I like the name of democracy. Yeah, so that's why I choose that. So this is my my last slide. <laughs> Yeah. 
Hello. Um. Okay. I suppose it's there somewhere. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, it's there. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for being here. And thank you, um, Asia Society, for bringing us all here. Um, it's a great honor. I really appreciate this. Um, and it's great to be here again, especially acknowledging recent history. Um, <laughs> remembering the Asia Contemporary Art Week um, that had just passed this last week um, here as well. And that three years ago in 2014, um, they have kindly invited me to contribute to their first edition. So that was a real honor as well. And um, that was recorded as well. And um, um, and I'm, I'm sure easily Googleable. Um, and so um, to avoid repeating myself, uh, I will pick up from there. Uh, as a lot has happened these three years as well, which um, is impossible to cover it in um, less than 10 minutes. Um, so, um, um, well, this past three years in terms of my thinking and also the projects that I've been doing and where I'd like to go to, this is, this is the focus of, of uh, my presentation today. So in this next, um, hopefully nine minutes or less, <laughs> um, I will explain this very qu quickly through a few points. And... Hopefully it's there. Um, yep. So first, shifting focus. Um, material culture of the border, material culture of connection. And, um, and then I will also go through two of my recent works, um, Five Tons of Homes and Other Understories, and 40,000 Homes and a Sense of Security. So. Firstly, um, to give you a summary, these past three years which had followed after um, the um, Asia Contemporary Art Week and, and also coinciding with the completion of my PhD, practice-based PhD, I have been basically shifting focus. Um, what I mean by shifting focus is not like looking elsewhere. Um, I guess the metaphor of the stereogram has often been used for this act of shifting focus. Um, not Instagram, um, you know, they're, they're, they were, uh, stereograms were very popular in the 90s, pre-public inter, pre internet, I mean. Um, and I remember the first time I popped my stereogram cherry, and it was amazing. <laughs> I was still in architecture school back then, and one day at the end of our studio session, um, quite a lot of people gathered in front of the hall, and I could hear wowing everywhere, and, and people would say, yes, yes, I can see it, I can see it, as though they were having an, an epiphany. Um, so, so I was curious and found my way to the front, and uh, all I could see was this disappointing tiled pattern image printed on an A4 paper behind the glass window, and everyone was looking at it though. So I was curious, and instead of dismissing them, the group, as delusional, I listened to their tips, and there it was. The patterns magically transformed into a 3D picture of a sunken ship with fish, treasure chest, and everything. So. To see a stereogram, you need to shift your plane of focus to be able to see a different picture. Um, note that this is not the same as shifting your angle to get a different perspective. No, you're not moving, you're not shifting positions, you just change the way you look at things. Um, the different picture has actually been there all along it's the way you see that changes. So this is a metaphor, of course, and not everyone can actually see stereograms. Um, I just thought this uh, stereogram example can help explain how I have been shifting focus these past three years. Um, now, 
while trying to emulate the social dynamics of the border before these past three years, I, I realized that I rely a lot on things. Um, and there we come, and there we go. <laughs> Material culture of the, of the border was my focus. Um, and um, I, was, I was looking into it um, through my projects with uh, passports, the walls, and maps. Um, and this is one way to look at it, of course. Um, I was also looking, for example, at the structure of, what, um, of that, that practice-based research through, um, for example, Jared Toll's uh, critical geopolitics framework, <coughs> but which I'm not going to elaborate this time. But yeah, in a way, I worked with the material culture of the border. Now, you know when we think about borders, about the borders of our country, for example, um, we tend to think of it as the end, right? The end of our country's territory. Um, uh, it's, it's like um, our skin is the end, the end, uh, the outer limit of our flesh. What we tend to disregard is that um, this border is actually connected to something else. Our end, our limit, is actually the beginning of something else. And so the border is actually an interface. So to talk about material culture of the border can mean that we're talking about material culture of connection. And this is what I've been thinking about a lot these past three years. And to go to my last point, I'll illustrate this thoughts in two examples of my recent work, Five Sons of Homes and Other and the Stories and 40,000 Homes and a Sense of Security. Five thousand, uh, five tons of homes and other under stories is um, part of a longer project that I call Tra Trace Transit, which is a uh, public intervention and mobile ethnography of things. Um, and the thing here is the cardboard waste. So it's public intervention and mobile ethnography into the informal trade route of cardboard waste in Hong Kong. You can see um, the film, which is part of this exhibition, um, which um, um, will tell you about the process as well. It's called Proposal for a Film Within the Leaves, A Side of the Forest. Um, and you can see how the project unfolds there. Uh, basically, I was doing a mobile ethnography as an artist, uh, tracing cardboard ways that brings together all these different groups of people in this informal trade route together. Five Sons of Homes and Other Understories is a work of accumulation that took two years to make. Um, and in making 40,000 homes and a sense of security, sorry, yes, 40,000 homes and a sense of security, I didn't have the two years um, that I had in tr um, tra Trace Transit. So I had to compress this mobile ethnography of things into two weeks, <laughs> or a little bit more, actually. Um, we'll have to wait until this is over, and then you'll, you'll see the, the pictures of, of 40,000 homes and a sense of security. Um, So 40,000 homes and a sense of security was done in the Netherlands um, during an ultra short residency in the Rijks Academy. And what I did was to focus on postcards as the things that go through interfaces. The 900 postcards from form a story about modern day Hansel and Gretel who work as freelance mail deliverers in the privatized Dutch postal system. 
The 900 postcards were posted from different places in the Netherlands to the Rijks Academy where I was based. And when they arrived to me, I processed them to reveal the fingerprints that they picked up along the way. So, and I should just stop here and we could discuss further, further in our Q&A. Thank you. So we have um, a few minutes for a conversation between the artists. Thank you all for your very insightful um, introductions to your recent work. I think one thing that really struck me was, um, you know, each of your use of, as um, Tintin calls it, material culture um, to create your work and in using it to kind of distill and, recon and reconsider. Um, the socio-political kind of landscape um, that you're working within. Um, and I guess I would be interested in hearing your elaboration on, you know, um, this decision to focus, you know, in, on, in your case, on found materials kind of to illuminate these hidden narratives or to, to using kind of these um, transitory materials or things that um, are exchanged um, and thought of as maybe discardable materials um, as as these vehicles and and how they're more um, how they better allow you I guess to express your ideas and your vision um, and your practices if you want to go for it. okay um, yes um, well uh, yeah as I as I mentioned um, things have been you know, um, gradually emerging, basically, you know, when when I started doing the border works, I was thinking more about the the the, the gathering of people and the, the recreating of that social dynamics. But um, but then uh, more and more, I realized without the things, I can't communicate, basically, and that's um, um, uh, that's that's sort of um, uh, where it started, and. Um, um, uh, I think, you know, like, uh, uh, when I use passports, maps, and borders, um, a lot of people relate to it. Uh, but then when I use cardboards, I feel that it's just more widespread. And um, um, so I can touch more people with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's very daily. It's, it's, you know, it's part of my life. It's part of your life as well. Um, and um, and postcards as well, you know, it's it's such a daily thing that um, it's easy to find it anywhere. And it's a, yeah, it's a broader point of entry yeah, it's a broader people. point uh -huh. of entry and and um, and to show these connections as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And Tim, any thoughts? Um, I because I was I was trained as a photographer. I didn't go to fine art. Uh, through the fine art program. So images is very important for me. And so as, as you see why those vernacular photo uh, photographs that I've been collecting over mm -hmm. the years, and they, they sort of became the material that, that I I've always use, kind of come back to it. Um, and because they, the, and also the, the drawings by the senior artists, uh, they, they're more than just, uh, these little things, they are a record, a documentation of a particular time. Uh, and uh, they, particularly for places like Vietnam, uh, this record uh, became very important from, uh, as evidence also. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think uh, my approach is more, it's slightly different than yours, but I think we, we understand they all are evidence. Mm -hmm. of, of, of a kind of exchange kind or of event. In a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's how I think many artists, uh, we, we come to this evidence and this material and we're trying to 
kind of uh, bring forth their stories uh, up, up uh, or hidden stories mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we that uh, in general people sort of kind of dismiss them because those those photographs the vernacular for the photographs without me uh, trying to uh, contextualize them they have no meaning to uh, a lot of people and even the, the the communist government who are so good at censor everything, they completely dismiss the, these photographs. Uh, and you know, so, so I think for, for us, that's what we do, that we give uh, this material that everybody sort of dismiss and not paying attention to uh, a, a life, a life uh -huh. that, that uh, yeah. So. Wonderful, and uh, with, with you, Mossad, I mean, thinking how you're incorporating these cocktails with a certain sense of levity or some of your other performances where you have this exchange with the audience and in some cases, you know, with this um, Myanmar cocktail um, project, you know, they're actually physically um, ingesting history or they're kind of, in, they're internalizing this idea that you are trying to communicate with them and it becomes this dialogue and this kind of exchange with the history, the local history. I mean, how could you elaborate yeah, on like that a the, little bit? Most of my performance, like uh, you see the face and finger performance, this 10 years ago, and video, and five years ago. Yeah, so this is early of my piece, uh, focus about the hand. But like a year after, the transition time, so we have a first election in the 2010, so like over the five decade, they did the shit. So after that, I, I started to realize that what we are going to do. So like, uh, that's why I try to look back to the history. And that kind of, like that history at first, in the early stage, not really a long history, like a 20 year history the experience of my, my generation living under the dictatorship, like uh, uh, 2019, yeah. So later I try to go how far I can go, but because that kind of thing, like uh, what happened in 90s and whatever in 2000, so uh, at that time you cannot talk about that, like uh, a lot of censorship, and so you cannot criticize the government, yeah. So that's when, but now we have a kind of a big freedom of expression, so that's why we can look back and try to be uh, understand what was happening and uh, criticize about that uh, time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so later I think okay, the junta time, and so later how far you can go and so the British colony and Japanese colony, and yeah, so I like to talk about the the kind of history lesson and yeah. Yeah, chit chat with the audience and also the stuff to the the train, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that where we relate with the history, yeah. So uh, and I mm -hmm. guess on this uh, continuing at kind of on this idea of history and thinking about infrastructure or thinking about um, developing narratives where maybe they may not have been um, present. Um, you know, I think what you've done and especially in, in Vietnam with Sanard and with um, the development of um, the foundation to really develop an infrastructure so that you have cr you are creating a platform for dialogue and for creation. Um, and with your performance festival, Mosat, um, you know, just that importance of, of creating community, as you said. Um, I mean, did you find it difficult to to undertake these kinds of initiatives in your respective um, communities uh, and how do you find with kind of a greater awareness of art from Southeast Asia um, and kind of these emerging platforms or kind of you know the the kind of growth of platforms you know with in the form of biennials or other kind of exhibitions, international exhibitions that are focusing on work from the region, but also from the pedagogical perspective, you know, um, university programs or, or scholarly initiatives that are focusing more on art and um, kind of the socio, uh, 
political climate in the region, do you find that it is becoming easier or do you find that it's still very challenging um, to continue to develop this infrastructure? Well, in my case, uh, Santa became too successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, the government sort of put a spotlight on us and they make life quite difficult. But then, you know, it's like censorship. You just uh, change. Mm -hmm. You just, uh, you have to be flexible. You can't be rigid as an institution. Uh, so, uh, so because that exhibition and the residency became such an issue with the, the, the government, now we decide to do the curatorial training program next year. So we, we, we don't have to deal with the cultural police anymore. Uh, and so we'll do it, the training privately. And the, net, that gener uh, the, the 10 or so young art, uh, curator that's coming out uh, will continue to support them behind the scene. Um, you know, and, and we'll just, and I think that's, in places like that, sort of this kind of things happened mm -hmm. all the time. And you sort of, instead of, Persist well, and, if you mm -hmm. complained about it, nobody cared because uh, it just, uh, it's, um, there's no first uh, freedom of speech or First Amendment or anything like that to protect us. Um, so you just kind of change and you have to be, yeah, you just move forward uh, in a different way. And um, that's, uh, yeah, so it's, I, I don't think it's more difficult. It's just that, it's just a different set you of rules. You have to recalibrate yeah. yourself yeah. and your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, like, the Beyond Pressure, the festival would I uh, curate, like 10 years ago in 2008. So the name of the, the festival is uh, uh, when we start to curate, so me and my colleague try to f give a name of the festival. What what title should we give? So at that time, 2008, so we see a, a little bit like the country will be changed soon. So that's why, okay, so what were we going to do after the pressure, beyond the pressure? So that's why we give the name of the, the beyond pressure name. And the, another reason is like, um, when we start to organize that thing. So yeah, at that time around, we have uh, like around 20, 25 the performer artists in the whole country of the Myanmar. Like the front, front the like, like around five artists can go, go out, can get the chance to go outside. So that's why, so I try to be, make a bridge between the like Myanmar and Indonesian state. So I bring to some performer artists and so, bring out to the, the performances to the Myanmar. Because whenever I go out, they ask me, oh, Musa, is there any contemporary artist like you in your country? I say, of course, yeah, a lot, yeah. So, but the outside world didn't know that, and so, so that's just the reason we start. And then, also the Beyond Pressure is uh, like gradually changed from the, 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 the system and name of the festival. In the early stage, we focus the, only the performer art, and then we make a performer art in the public space. Because we are a big, uh, like, in the performer art start in the 90s, so they only happen in the private gallery and the, the, the small circle, so only like 10 to 20 audience. That for us, my generation, we need to be like a big wider audience and reach to the, the, to the public. So that's why we, we start to organize in the public space. So, yeah, so that in the fifth edition of Beyond Pressure, start to change the contemporary art to the, uh, the, the performer art to contemporary art. So we invite the installation artists and video artists, and also I showed the tending video <laughs> in a couple of years ago in the Beyond Pressure, and also graffiti artists. So in the last version, it's called the uh, Public Art, Beyond Pressure Public Art Festival. So we make a, like a, a we run the best, and then the, the that's best is actually the, the, the routine around the, the, the downtown. And then we screen in the video on, on the bus, and so audience can get the chance to take a bus, and they can get just to see yeah, so how we can reach to the Orient. Also, one we make in the park is called the People Park. So they have like a lot of the. We did the uh, even in the weekend. So there's a lot of the like 
two to five hundred people hanging out in there. So when we make an event, they automatically become our audience. So even if the the audience from Osaka didn't show up, it's okay. So we are working with the general audience, but someone did not really understand what oh what are they doing? Are they doing the magic show or yeah? Mm-hmm. So because it's Myanmar, people are very <laughs> very uh, curious. Kacha, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, also, yeah. So that's gradually the the beyond pressure is quite success in the in, in the region. The the perform in terms of the perform art festival, yeah. Could I ask uh, the this also theater absurd or theater something? After, yeah. Uh, that what what uh, because I I came maybe that that was the beyond pressure. Performance that was in the under French, pressure. under pressure, <laughs> under pressure. Uh, so, uh, Lintet, uh-huh. would it you and Lintet organize uh, that? No, that? Lintet organized the Theodore S- District, sep- ah, and then ah. I organized the Beyond Pressure. Ah. But it's like 2008, we call like, it's, it's like kind of the bombing year of the Myanmar, ah. Myanmar contemporary art history. Like the, my colleague, the Linda, he organized his own p- uh, festival, like Theodore's led the performer art. It's called the Theodore District. So I myself, so called, be, organized the Beyond Pressure. And Echo, he organized the New Zero Festival. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Pew Moon, she organized the Blue Wind Woman Art Festival Media. So it's that year, is like, so we really yeah, I think I shaken their whole history in, in, in Myanmar. I came to two, I came yeah. to Linted. Uh, um, uh, it was quite interesting yeah. uh, to, to see but that now happen. now it's a big, the, the interesting period is that the, after the, the like, um, um, like tra- transition period, after the Tititachi, the performance is a big silent and fade off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so maybe we have not really in in the past we have won the the taka the enemy is the, the government so now it's a, we don't need to do well, that thing. With the proliferation of all of these avant-garde groups um, and festivals, do you find that there is more of a cohesion between the kind of established government art cult, art and cultural institutions mm-hmm. and these more avant-garde? Um, groups, or do you still find that there is a, a kind of a, a divide? Do you feel that there is kind of a coming together? And uh, now we saw some of the like uh, a new collective came up. Yeah, so like the the also the the the, the ACC Grandi, the Aumiate, he he make called the like Soka, like School of Contemporary Art, like uh, online the the course goes for the contemporary art, mm-hmm. yeah. And then the some young the performer artists they try to uh, make their collective movement and yeah. So but for my generation, uh, we are now we're not really focused their perform art anymore. We do mm-hmm. dif- different stuff and like a uh, installation video and also that like a long duration of the performance piece, yeah. So so that's why we are a bit busy to own our own stuff, so not have time to be, be the organize the festival. Also, mm-hmm. Linda also he do the master in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so I think I, yeah. I was uh, in, in the early ninety. I was so interested in a Myanmar art scene because almost every artist is a painter and a performance artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's like uh, it's, you're just not a performance yeah. only for one, but yeah. uh, and how did that yeah. whole mm-hmm. performance uh, begins? Uh, I mean, uh, I I heard some story, but yeah. I I heard from you uh, almost. Uh, yeah, all yeah. these young like artists the, became performance. Yeah, artists. most of the like uh, even the poet, so they do the mm-hmm. like uh, mm-hmm. doing the called the performance poetry. So they do mm-hmm. recite and do some action. Yeah. So, yeah, like at the time, we have like kind of the love, love of the knowledge. So like, oh, if you do contemporary, what kind of do you are? Your painting is not contemporary. That's why you can do performance or you make an installation. Mm. It means you are like a label of the contemporary artist. Yeah? So that's why people try to be practice in the, in the field of their performer art. Yeah. 
I mean, there was a sim similar phenomenon with contemporary artists from China because there were a certain generation who were trained academically as painters, but then when, you know, in the early 90s and through the 90s, they kind of shifted to performance or mm -hmm. video or photography, but it was more, I think, as under duress rather than, or, you know, I think there were a number of reasons, but I think, you know, certainly, um, like you said, kind of this idea of, of mobili being nimble, you know, and kind yeah. of recalibrating yeah. oneself to yeah. Also to be in, able to in Myanmar, like um, the visual artists and the uh, uh, literature circuit are a big clue. So we hang out and drink together yeah. with the poet and yeah. So that's why like in the in the nineties and late 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 nineties and early two thousand, the place where we perform is in the like uh, uh, restaurant or beer bar for yeah. So like person just hang out and then some people try other way. Stand up and recite the poem no. and then, okay, I do some action and yeah, so so this is how, how they uh, <laughs> uh, collaborate in the in the the, the, the poetry sake and the, the video sake. Yeah. Interesting in, in terms of performance actually because I remember growing up in Indonesia under Suharto mm -hmm. knowing performance art as part of protest. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's um yeah, it's 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 um, and I didn't know anything about art. I mean, I didn't know anything about being an artist, and I didn't, I didn't imagine, you know, like one day being an artist back then. But um, yeah, I sort of, you know, like see this. Uh, um, As a I mean, yeah, gesture. it's a very uh. political gesture, and it's it's always on the streets, and you know, um, which is also really interesting because when Suharto fell, it was actually films that we, uh, we had the first um, Jakarta International Film Festival then, and then there is the independent film, um, film, uh, video and film festival as well. So it's film, uh, because maybe under Suharto we had only one channel of this Hollywood film, like bombardment of um, Hollywood film. Um, uh, Ruang Rupa actually um, um, also started, but a bit later in 2000. Mm -hmm. Um, and they become quite a big force um, in um, well in Indonesia and especially in Jakarta. And they work with um, urban public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with um, kind of yes, Indonesian yeah, intervention. Uh, yes, kind that's of right. Yeah, motivating yeah. Uh, dialogue. And yeah, and I think I think a lot of um, um, from being you know uh, I I actually started in that film scene as well, and uh, I also established this short film organization. Uh, programming short films for discussion, so always screenings and discussions. It's more, you know, like crit um, 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 uh, cultivating critical thinking, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think the the the, the it's really interesting. The 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 the, the, the main uh, point of discussion, <laughs> sort of we're actually funding like you know we we always struggle with okay so we want to do this but you know where do we find money mm -hmm. although a lot of these people are actually working you know unpaid volunteering um and um yeah i think uh, there's just so much um uh need to actually form an uh, you know an alternate image mm -hmm. of um, of um, an alternate imagining of the country as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that's yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, I think we have time for two questions from the audience. If anybody has questions for the artists, there's one here. Thank you so much, artist. Ah, um, uh, there's a microphone. Thank you for sharing your work with us. I have a question for all three artists, and I'm wondering about um, the issue of audience reception. Um, for example, uh, for Dinkule and for Tintin, you talk about how you're reappropriating certain objects, right, from the cardboard to the helicopters, to change the way that the audience would talk about the history or the materiality of these objects. And I know that you're not there um, every day during the exhibition, but are there some concrete examples they can share with us, you know, the conversation that you hear the audience having with you or the artwork? And similar, to, um, similarly for Mozart, when they're ingesting the cocktails, so they talk about um, um, 
uh, what they feel, right? Either about the colonial times or even when they're ingesting your democratic cocktail, right? As we know, the transition to democracy is not this utopian, linear kind of historical um, a progress, right? There's, there's also um, certain tensions, right, within, the, the, within this transition. So I'm just wondering um, whether you have any examples to share with us. Um, yeah, uh, I can share maybe two of um, those examples. Um, one is from a work that I didn't really show. Um, it's called Make Your Own Passport. And it's a performance, workshop performance, I call it, uh, which um, is done in markets. And I do it in markets because this is, uh, I made this, I started making this in 2014. And um, um, I, uh, at that point, I said that one thing to really go out, I don't want to, you know, um, I don't want to limit myself, basically, okay. Um, and uh, markets for me was, um, you know how Saskia Sassen say that the city is the new, um, um, new uh, frontier? Um, because a lot of people from different backgrounds um, gather there, and there's no rule, basically, no rule yet. Um, and I think markets in the city is especially um, 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 ripe of that gathering, basically. And, and um, uh, back to my um, um, thinking about things, um, people go to markets because they look for things, and so they're visually very alert. And that's, that's why I staged this uh, Make Your Own Passport in markets. And basically what, what happens is, you know, like people come in and, um, and they'll see these passports and they're like, what's happening? What's happening? What are you doing? And so, um, and I would say, okay, so just pick, uh, um, uh, what do you, do you call that? Uh, there's a lucky dip, basically. And you can, you can get your citizenship through that lucky dip. And you can get stateless as well. And if you're, you get stateless, then you get a story about the stateless person. But anyway, um, so people, people would make their own passports and you know, would gather and stuff. And um, um, reactions, reaction-wise. Um, well, I did this in Chicago um, last year, just after Trump was elected. And someone actually said that um, she, well, I mean, it was written. Uh, she has been um, processing this, you know, like the aftermath of the election because she she's American and her husband um, um, was do, uh, was um, uh, uh, going through a process of, of naturaliza uh, naturalization, basically. And, and she said um, the artwork helps her to process this um, complex feelings. And she feels that she's less alone. Um, but then, uh, earlier in 2014, actually, um, when I was doing this performance in in Canada, this is it's, it's really interesting because I did it I did it in, in in two bordering cities, right? One in Detroit, well, uh, a few performances in Detroit and a few performances in in Windsor in Canada. And um, uh, in Windsor, I got a very angry reaction. Yeah. Um, uh, someone actually barged in and s accused me of, you know, smuggling people over the border and this kind of thing. And, and it was impossible to um, sit down with him and discuss this. And so, so since then, I have been also trying to um, uh, find ways to um, uh, face this, to, to handle this. And I think, um, so now, now I have this form of disagreement. Like, so if you disagree with this, why? You know, sit down and just tell us. Um, so, so, um, so that's that's the two reactions of uh, make your own passport. And um, so, um, as I said, I always want to, you know, like go out and because I, I really I think um, the words of Ben Anderson, Benedict Anderson, really echoes with me. Um, especially, you know, like imagine communities, and especially because Indonesia is one of the cases. Um, and as Bun Hui earlier said, you know, like the, the nation is very much disputable in, um, in, in Southeast Asian context, I think. Um, so, uh, so, you know, um, if a nation is an imagined community, then, um, well, okay. Uh, let me quote someone else now, uh, Nikos Papasregiadis, um, communication scholar. 
said that um, so he believes that artists not uh, artists um, don't only reflect society they also contribute to this imagining and I think that, that you know like that those two matches together and that's why I want to go out and you know like really contribute and really with a mission basically it's like a campaign <laughs> in a way but yeah um, 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 make um, sorry uh, five uh, Three, three transit, five, five sons of homes and other, other stories. I actually did that in an art fair, basically looking for you know hundreds of thousands of, of um, audience. And what happened was in the, in the press conference, it, it captured um, some uh, press agencies already. And so basically, in, in four days, it was all over. It was mentioned all over. And, we, um, and to magnify that, actually, we had um, also um, uh, workshops in the art fair with Asia Art Archive to talk about the, the issues. And so yeah, in, in, a, in four days, it reached like 87, more than 87 international and local media as well. And local media actually encouraged me to write a book about it. So. And you know I can't stop talking about <laughs> it if, <laughs> if I'm not stopping here, so, <laughs> so I should stop. Jim, do you have anything to contribute um, to well, the question? Well, uh, the piece downstairs is quite is very problematic in Vietnam. Um, on one hand, uh, the younger generation think that I would be invited to participate to join the Communist Party because of this piece. And they hated this piece yeah. because uh, they they have been uh, they felt that the government have been brainwashing them all this time, and I'm again giving the platform for for this group of artists who have been uh, uh, in a way kind of in their their eyes the younger generation that this artists have been brain, brainwashed by the. Communist Party, so they they really hate this. But the the older generation, uh, they actually, particularly the one that fought under um, against the French, they understand why there was a need to kind of revisit this, and and um, it's not about communism that this this artists are fighting for. So the the younger generation are still so angry at the current communist government that they cannot see this work properly. Uh, they cannot. And so, uh, but the other piece, which is the counter-narrative to this piece, which is Vision in Darkness, about Dung Dung Tin, they love that piece. <laughs> the younger generation, but the older generation hated it. So it's, it's just like, I'm, I'm not winning point with anybody <laughs> in, in Vietnam. And so next year, uh, we're going to show both of these piece in San Jose, which have a large Vietnamese community. So I either be get tar and feather, <laughs> or, or they like me. Well, it's, both pieces are going to be in the same play at the same time. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how the Vietnamese American community uh, react to this, this, this work together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, on that note, I think we'll have to reconvene at Din's exhibition at the San Jose Museum to see how everybody reacts. But I want to thank you all for joining us for this um, symposium this afternoon. I hope that you um, appreciated the commentary and, and the um, presentations from all of our speakers as much as I have.